Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening as we convene and talk about something very important to all of us. Uh, this is a nationwide conversation. Um, it's a tough conversation, but we can't be afraid to talk about suicide. Right now, it is the second leading cause of death for young people ages 10 to 24. Four to five teens who attempt suicide have given clear warning signs. So that brings us here this evening to talk about suicide and how we can come together as a community to support each other and our youth. Um, at this time, we do have a format that I was going to go ahead and have Tracy Meidel and introduce her. She will be the moderator and I'll have her go over the format uh, for this evening. We are making sure that this is being uh, taped. We have KSPS here, or recorded rather, and uh, KSPS is here and we'll be sharing this panel uh, information out to the public and we look forward to sharing that far and wide. So this time, please help me in welcoming Tracy Meidel. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Redinger, for the introduction. As Dr. Reidinger said, this is a nationwide conversation and a tough one at that. And I thank you for coming out and taking the time out of your schedule to be here. But a special thanks to all the panelists that have come here as a resource to answer questions. And they are also going to stay a little bit after if you want to have a one on one. But I do want to discuss a little bit of the format. I'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves and their or organization. And then also, uh, while I'm answering or asking the panelists a few generalized questions about the topic of suicide, I'm going to have Aaron and Jody, they're, gonna, they're in the back raising their hand, they're gonna be coming down each of the aisles and they're going to have index cards with them. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and they will come give you an index card. You can write your, your question on the card, they will pick them up and then they will bring them up to me so that your questions can be answered. Now what happens sometimes is a lot of people have the same question and what they will do is combine questions so that they will all get answered hopefully. If you find that your question does not get answered then please stay after and you can ask your question one on one or we can make sure that somebody connects you and connects with you to get the answer. So with that, I would like to have the panelists introduce themselves. My name is David Crump. I work for Spokane Public Schools. Do you want me to explain the program a little bit? Yes, and your role. Okay. I'm director in uh, student services, work with uh, high schools in the mental health program that the district has. The district is really unique in the fact that it's uh, one of a few school districts across the nation that is actually a licensed mental health and substance use provider. We have 49 licensed mental health clinicians. Uh, we are in 49 different schools, uh, ranging elementary, middle, and high school, as well as uh, what we call program schools. And uh, we provide uh, uh, services such as individual therapy, group therapy, family therapy. We also have, um, and I'll let Chris talk about the crisis teams, uh, which are really a resource to the schools, so thank you. Hi, I'm Misty Southall, and I'm the clinical supervisor at Passages Family Support. We do individual and family work. We are peer-led, meaning um, all of the clinicians and the peer specialists and the case managers are people with lived experience. So. We do therapy in the home. We are community-based. If somebody wants to come in to the office, it's fine, but we tend to go out to the homes mostly. We have just onboarded a WISE team, actually three, and a Peer Bridger program, trying to help people get out of Eastern State Hospital. Oh, so we do um, a lot of um, P 
peer support groups to help build the natural supports for maybe a parent struggling and can relate to other parents in that group. We do peer-led groups for the youth and they go on a lot of different outings that they might not be able to go to on a normal basis. And we also do therapeutic groups for the youngest five and six year olds and then we have therapeutic group for the teens and we have adult therapeutic groups. So we pretty much do everything. I'm Mariah Rhodes. I'm the Director of Transitional Services at Frontier Behavioral Health. I run the Mobile Community Assertive Treatment Team, or MCAT, and I also run um, 12 different wraparound intensive services for kids, or the WISE teams. Um, my MCAT team is a wraparound service that provides crisis intervention and linkage to resources in the community. Um, we um, have the availability to serve anybody regardless of insurance um, and really with the purpose of connecting them to the appropriate resource in the community and then providing short-term crisis intervention on a voluntary basis. Um, we run Monday through Friday 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. and then we also are available on the weekends 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. And all of our services are typically outreached into the community so we're able to go into hospitals, we're going to, to clients' homes. Um, homeless shelters, pretty much anywhere within Spokane County that they need to be seen is where we'll go. Um, we also um, provide nursing services in the sense of being able to provide nursing assessments in the home. We have chemical dependency professionals and we also have peer support and mental health professionals as well. The other teams that I run are the WISE services. Um, we are one of many numerous agencies that have WISE teams here in Spokane County. Um, the WISE teams are a wraparound intensive service that provides um, services in the home to kids from zero to 20 um, that are Medicaid here in Spokane County. Um, majority of our services are done in the home, in the school as well, and so they're very non-traditional intensive services for families. Um, the families that we typically serve are families that um, have really not been um, successful in traditional outpatient treatment and probably require a high le higher level of intensity really with the purpose for preserving that child in their home environment and preventing long-term inpatient treatment. Hi, I'm Jelaine Christian Stoker and I'm a clinical supervisor with Lutheran Community Services. Um, we are actually a very large organization um, across the Northwest. Um, we have services in, in Western Washington, in, in Pierce, King, and Snohomish County in eastern Washington in Spokane and the Tri-Cities and in Oregon from Portland all the way down to Klamath. Um, the services in Spokane include in-office counseling services. We serve all ages, children as young as three years old up through um, a geriatric population. We also um, are licensed with the state to, um, to uh, license and provide foster care services. I think we have 10 or 11 foster homes that we supervise. We serve a large population of adult refugees who have come to us um, through World Relief. Um, and something that's very unique about Lutheran Community Services is we also serve the Unaccompanied Refugee Minor Program, one of 24 in the United States. And these are um, typically adolescents who have escaped war-torn countries and have um, come to refugee camps and then go through a very intensive vetting process before they're approved for relocation to the United States. Um, we have refugees from Northern Africa, from Myanmar, from Central America, and once they come and are located in Spokane, they're either put in a foster home or a group home, they attend school, our public schools here, and they have an opportunity to begin a new life. We have a very, very strong domestic violence and advocacy program through Lutheran Community Services. We provide legal advocacy, we provide support for victims of domestic violence. Um, we also provide campus advocacy, we have a, um, a relatively new program partnering with Gonzaga University. Um, we, we do presentations all over the county for um, ending domestic violence. We also are known, our reputation is known for treatment for children 
with, uh, and youth with um, sexual maladaptive behaviors. Some of these children are involved in the legal system, some of them are not. But we, um, we have quite a number of, of children involved with, with our program. Um, we provide in-home and school-based counseling services as well. Um, we're in the Cheney schools, we're up in Deer Park, we are able to use one of the Lutheran churches in Deer Park and also services in the school there in the Mead School District and some of the schools in Spokane. And then like the other programs, we also run two WISE teams, the Wraparound Intensive Services, to provide services for really high, high-risk children and families. Thank you. Hi, my name is Claire Aberastri, and I'm the Behavioral Health Director for the Native Project. Um, at the Native Project, we have a number of services. We are a medical clinic. Uh, we have our own pharmacy. We also provide dental services. Um, we also focus a lot on diabetes and diabetic care. Uh, we also have a prevention program. Um, we also have care coordinators that work very closely with our medical patients um, to assist them with other services that they may need in the community. As part of our behavioral health services, um, we have what is called integrated care, and uh, we have adult providers who work with patients that come in for medical appointments and need to see a counselor that day. They can be seen immediately. Uh, we do provide for our adults. We don't provide ongoing counseling, but we do provide mental health um, assessments, and we also offer med medication management for our behavioral health patients. For youth, um, we do provide mental health counseling for children as young as four um, on up, and then we also have a drug and alcohol uh, program for teenagers. Hello, I'm Stacy Cornwell, and I'm the Director of Crisis Response Services at Frontier Behavioral Health, and I oversee three programs there. One of them is our 211 call center, which is a health and social service resource line that's open Monday through Friday, eight to five. And recently we've been very focused on providing more outreach services in looking at homeless prevention and providing homeless resources to individuals and families. The other program that I oversee is First Call for Help. Some of you may have heard of that call center. It's a 24 seven crisis hotline. It's the number that you would call when you are in a crisis after hours daytime hours, and hopefully um, because you call them, they will get you to the right person, whether it's first call for help, a mental health provider, or a crisis response person. The other program that I oversee is crisis response services, and this is a mobile crisis outreach team. We're available 24-7. Like the MCAT team, we also do not require any sort of insurance. We are free service that's provided to the community. We'll go anywhere in Spokane County. Sometimes people come to us. We go into the schools, hospitals, we go into juvenile detention, jails, really anywhere in Spokane County. Uh, the difference with our programs, and I don't know if we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but one of the tasks that my team is, um, that my team, the service that my team provides is the involuntary treatment assessments as well. And so this is a assessment that will determine for a youth 13 and above whether or not they need involuntary psychiatric treatment because they are presenting with suicidal thoughts or maybe homicidal thoughts, or they are not able to take care of themselves because of a mental disorder. And so we have ability to impose that treatment. That is the last resort. We really want to work with children and families and individuals to come up with a plan that can keep them in the community to access treatment on a voluntary basis. But we know that there are some situations where um, people are not able to agree to that type of help or do not believe they need that kind of help. And so we're there as sort of that extra safety net for them. Hello, my name is Jeremy Williams. I'm the nurse manager for emergency and outpatient psychiatry at Sacred Heart Medical Center, uh, which is part of Providence uh, Healthcare, which is a non-for-profit here in Spokane and throughout both the Western uh, region and now that we've merged with uh, St. Joseph's, we're also down in Texas and Southern California. Uh, currently for adults, the services that we provide, we have an uh, AGPU, which is an adult unit, uh, which services 18 and over. Um, and then for our uh, pediatric patients, we have both a, a PCCA, which is an inpatient for adolescents, 12 to age, uh, 17. 
And then we also have the BEST program, which is a hospital diversion for children. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into the ED side of things as uh, Debbie's here and she's gonna go into that a little bit, but um, just kind of touch on that. Currently in our ED, uh, we provide both, um, we have our psychiatric emergency department. We also have psychiatric uh, counselors in our psych triage uh, and um, consult psychiatry as well, both for adolescents and children and uh, uh, adults. Uh, my name is Eric Dotson, and I'm a clinical supervisor at Children's Home Society of Washington. Um, Children's Home Society of Washington has locations all throughout Washington State, and last year we celebrated our 120th birthday. I have not personally been there for the last 120 years, but um, <clears throat> it is kind of a, 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 um, a, an honor to work for a, a fairly long-standing organization. Um, we offer all kinds of different services to support kids and families from birth on up through uh, early adulthood. Um, we have early learning programs. We have partnerships with two child care centers in Spokane, Rainbow Connections, and Parkview Early Learning Center, where we uh, help to provide early Head Start services. We have a program called Parents as Teachers, which is a home visiting program for parents um, of kids uh, birth through age three. Um, in other locations in the state, we um, have adoption and permanency uh, services that we offer. Um, but one of the biggest services that we offer here in the Spokane area is our child and family counseling program. Um, so we can provide counseling services of all kinds, individual counseling, family counseling, group counseling, um, for kiddos really from infancy on up through early adulthood. Um, we also offer case management services, um, we can help to link, um, link families with some other resources in the community, like uh, the BEST program, for example, that was just mentioned, um, and help families to kind of navigate through um, some of the systems uh, in the community, whether it's CPS or juvenile court or you know, other kinds of systems interfacing with schools, primary care offices, um, and those kinds of things. We have um, three locations here in Spokane. We have a location in the Spokane Valley, we have a location at the Northeast Community Center um, in Hilliard, and then we also have a location out on the West Plains close to Airway Heights. Hello, I'm Seven Bustle. I'm with Odyssey Youth Movement. Odyssey Youth Movement is a 25-year-old organization serving lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning young people, currently ages 13 to 18. Um, I am the Director of Advocacy and Education, which means that all direct services that Odyssey provides, um, I have my hands in. So that includes a drop-in center over on Perry, where we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, for, uh, from 3 until 8. And on Friday, we're open until 9. Uh, we have a variety of programs that exist within the drop-in center. Um, ranging from basic needs, meals, hygiene, um, clothing closet, all the way up to um, leadership programs um, and higher engagement. We have programs within the schools where we're working with um, students and student advisors to support gay straight alliance clubs in the schools. And then we also have our um, advocacy and education program where we go out and work with anybody that um, touches the lives of young people to provide training and workshops. Hi, good evening. My name is Chris Moore, and I am a coordinator in student services in Spokane Public Schools. I work with counselors from, the, from our K-12 counseling program. I'm the lead of, the, of our crisis team for Spokane Public Schools, so when one of our schools loses a, a staff member, a loved one, a student, we activate our crisis teams and we provide crisis intervention in the schools. All of our teams are highly trained in suicide prevention and intervention and crisis intervention. We have counselors in every school that's trained in suicide prevention. All of our nurses, our school psychologists, our mental health therapists, and our nurses are trained in suicide prevention. Spokane Public Schools and our Teaching and Learning Summer Institute, we provide uh, suicide prevention classes that are able to be accessed from all of our staff. 
I've trained office managers in suicide prevention. I've done parent groups to train in suicide prevention. And it's absolute, it's, it's ongoing work that, that I have a passion for. Um, we have a lot of support for our students that, that need support around suicide prevention. And I thank you for being here this evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Clark. I'm the program director for two service areas in uh, Frontier Behavioral Health, Child and Family Services, and then the Howard Branch, which is down in uh, the central part of Spokane. Um, Child and Family Services is the one service area in Frontier Behavioral Health, uh, health that serves exclusively serves children and their families. Um, there's a few adults on the caseload, but mostly we're serving children and their families. Uh, the clinicians at Child and Family um, will outreach to people in their homes, kids in their homes. We spend a lot of time in the schools. Of course, we provide services uh, in our office also. Um, but the clinicians um, are a dedicated group of children specialists. Most of them are child specialists at this point or, or are being trained in that direction. Uh, the Howard Branch um, is downtown, and it's sort of a full-service um, uh, mental health facility treating all age groups from uh, from four all the way through um, elderly and one of the things uh, one of the things about the Howard service areas that are a little bit different is that we have a program called fast program which um, is a group of clinicians that are embedded in the East Valley School District and we've had a relationship with East Valley School District for over a decade now and uh, one of the things that really is special about that program is that the way the funding is set up for that program allows our clinicians to treat every child regardless of whether or not um, they have insurance or Medicaid. Um, so um, they're able to treat everybody uh, without necessarily um, worrying about whether or not there's a financial capability to be able to support those services. And those clinicians, um, it's, it's sort of uh, a little bit humorous to me that, that I think they see themselves more identified with the East Valley School District than they do with Frontier Behavioral Health. Uh, because they have become so successfully embedded over time with that school district um, that I think that they're seen by the staff as just an extension of the programs that are offered in the school district. Hi, my name's Debbie Yordedal, and uh, I may work at Providence Sacred Heart, where I'm the psychiatric triage uh, supervisor and admission coordinator for our psychiatric floors. Um, we do see adolescents, we see children. Uh, we've seen them as young as two years old and we've seen adults as old as 101. Um, we are open 24 seven because we are an emergency room. Um, we are, I'm glad that we're doing this um, because we're seeing an increase in the ER in our numbers with kids, uh, with children. And uh, I'm a big proponent this isn't just my, you know, Sacred Heart's problem or Frontier, it's a community problem, and we all need to come together to solve this or try and at least move forward. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you all. We have a wealth of knowledge here at our panelists. Uh, as a first responder, I, I want to say how sad it is to respond to a death of anybody, but when you respond to a suicide, and then you add on the suicide of a youth or someone young or young people. It's just tragic. And it, it is a, we're at a point now in our society where suicide has touched us one way or another. We know somebody or we know of somebody that has attempted suicide or thought of suicide. So it's an important topic. I would ask our panelists that um, if you have something to say on any question, speak after the, the next person. We know that there's not just one answer up here, that we have several answers to your questions. And so I will, I will start us off again with three questions, but audience, I do ask you to, to raise your hand for questions and you will be provided with a card. So let's begin. I would like to ask first, what are the signs and symptoms of suicide? And I would ask that Stacy lead us off. I'm sorry, and I actually misspoke that. The signs and symptoms of depression. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I'll start off, um, for those of you that have heard me speak before, I usually will qualify my answer with this. And that is a lot of the things that we talk about today are going to sound like your loved ones, your youth, your children, your significant other, whatever persons you have in your life. But what we're really looking for when we're looking at depression is significant change. And so you might notice some change in someone's sleep or their appetite or their mood. Um, but what we're really looking for is a significant change in that, a significant change in their performance, whether it's academic performance, their grades are dropping, or if they work, their performance at work, if they've lost interest or are no longer attending school functions or activities, no longer hanging out with friends that they had hanged out bef with before. Those are the things that we're looking for, that significant change. Um, in addition to that, things like hopelessness or helplessness statements that imply that, feelings of you know worthlessness, those are things that we are trying to pay attention to. And we really rely on you all um, friends, family members to help um, bring that to someone's attention. Um, and then of course, if there is suicidal thoughts or if there's been even planning that has gone along with that, that's something that we really want to pay attention to. And I don't know if there's a follow-up question about suicide or if I should keep going or if someone else wants to chime in. I would ask our panelists, is there anybody else that has something to add? Probably the only thing that I would add to that is that oftentimes when we look at kids, especially younger kids that are struggling with some depression, um, what we may see more of than the, the sadness is irritability or anger. Um, oftentimes kids, the, the younger ones especially, that are, are struggling to be able to put things into words or express their feelings sort of in general, uh, we may see that, that emotion come out in, in behavior, in angry behavior or you know, a, a child that's become very easily irritable um, or has started to act out, um, those can be some of the signs that, that may also indicate depression. This is a tough one. What do I do if my child comes to me and says they want to kill themselves? The most important thing you can do is validate their feelings of hopelessness. Not to minimize, not to sweep it under the rug, not to pretend that it isn't so. Even with the youngest child who you believe can't appreciate the finality of death, if a child is telling you that they want to die, they are in a severe state of distress and the most important path out of it is connection to another understanding human being who can help them foster some hope and begin to see a path for themselves that they cannot see. Um, I actually had my child say that to me. She was in the ninth grade and she was struggling in and out of depression and she, I didn't, I, you know, that's actually what brought me into this field. So um, my biggest thing was, what can I do to make you feel safe? We ended up in the hospital that night, and I slept on the floor and stayed with her all night. So there was numerous hospitalizations, but um, I do think that if, you know, somebody's reaching out and saying different things like that, um, because there's a lot of different verbiage that goes along, just exploring exactly what, what they mean by that, if um, they have a plan, if there's you know, the means to the plan. But as a parent, um, keeping your child safe and, and going through that is a tremendous, there's just no words for it. It's just a tremendous um, heartache in every day going to work, worrying that is she going to be alive. She is alive and she overcame and she went to college and she's 23 now and it was a success story, but we did get a lot of the help that we needed and I got a lot of the support I needed, so that's really important. I was just gonna add something uh, pretty simple and I think that um, 
one of the most important things to do is um, recognize that when that question, when that statement is made to you, um, with respect to the safety of the child or the individual, all bets are off, you, you, safety comes first. Um, so for a parent um, asking for any and all help that's available, um, don't keep it a secret. Um, you know, in, the, in a community mental health setting, the phrase all bets are off really is one that I use as a, as a manager frequently when clinicians say that this has happened and do I have HIPAA violations that I have to be concerned about if I tell somebody this? And, um, and children will say, well, I'm gonna tell you this, but I'm, I, I don't want you to tell my parents or I don't want you to tell anybody. And that's where the all bets are off phrase comes in because it's about safety. And there's no promise of uh, confidentiality when it comes to something like this. It's true for professionals. I think it has to absolutely be true for families and parents. Um, when they're faced with a difficult situation like this with their kids. Get help, find help. Thank you. I was also going to emphasize the importance of, of families not going through this alone, that um, they need to reach out for help immediately because it's too big a burden for any one mm -hmm. family or one family member to try to bear on their own. And I would also just add a lot of this um, that we're talking about today is when you hear that response that yes, I'm thinking about killing myself. And what I hope you get out of this as well is some of that preventative um, thinking and that is you know, trying to prepare yourself for that type of response because what we hope happens if that occurs is that you're able to respond in a way that does not show judgment, that does not put the child or youth in a situation where they feel badly about sharing that information with you. And some of that really comes from you and, and kind of practicing, you know, asking that question and then, <clears throat> excuse me, being prepared for that response. And so even though you might not have had suicidal thoughts yourself and you might not be able to relate to that, you definitely can relate to feelings of sadness, feelings of hopelessness and despair. And so that's where that validation comes in. And the best advice that I can honestly give you from my experience from listening to hundreds and hundreds of people share their stories is what helped them was listening, not trying to fix their situation, but just listening to what they had to say. And in that of itself is where they'll start to find some hope that someone is out there that is caring for them. And also I want to throw this out too for the parents that may not have, you know, been ahead on the prevention side of things. I think too, you know, as parents it's very difficult when we want to be that, you know, that enclosing blanket of safety for our kiddos. And you know what? Sometimes we're not going to react the best way. But we do have to know that, you know, those kiddos, they come to us because they love us. They come to us because they trust us. You can recover from that. You know, if you open yourself up to your child, and like Stacy was saying, you make yourself vulnerable as well, there is recovery from, you know, a parental overreaction when you're just sitting there like, I have no clue what to say right now. And because that is difficult as a parent to hear that come from your own child is very difficult so please know too there is recovery from that from that situation through vulnerability and listening like everybody's saying listening is a big part of that communication between you and your kiddo and if you can show that vulnerability you can build that trust back thanks Jeremy I um I was I was going to piggyback on what Stacy on what Stacy shared and so I guess I'll piggyback on both of you I I I would encourage you to um, try to put yourself um, in check as much as you can from being in shock because this is something that more and more kids are talking about suicide and it's us the that, that are the adults that are so fearful of talking about suicide. Mm -hmm. So to try to put yourself in check and not be in shock and, and you know, scientists say that 80% of what we communicate is through our nonverbals, and really 20% is through our verbals. And, and try to be aware of that, because the last thing that you want to do as a parent 
with the very best of intention, you don't want to shut your child down. And some, some words in, in talking about how to, how to speak to someone in crisis, I would encourage you to listen as they both shared and to try to stay away from, I know how you feel. Because really, none of us know how that child feels. And, and I think that we communicate that oftentimes with people with the very best of intention. But I believe that when someone says to another person, I know how you feel, or it's going to be okay. Um, it, it's a way to shut down the communication. And really what you want to do is listen and just be with that child. And if you need to cry with your child, cry with your child. And keep those lines of communication open. One thing that I do want to share is talking to your child about suicide is not going to plant a seed where they will go out and now have the idea of suicide as an option. Kids are thinking about suicide. It's part of our culture. It's in songs, it's in movies, it's in television, it's everywhere. And it's we as adults that really need to challenge ourselves to not be afraid of suicide. Our kids are talking about it. We need to talk about it with them. And um, I, on that note, I will pass it. What I was gonna add to that is what piggyback on a lot of people don't be afraid to ask your child questions. For example, you know, if, if they come to you, they're, they're thinking about it. Uh, once you get over the initial shock is, you know, do they have a plan? I mean, if you can get yourself to, how imminent is it? Um, because those are important things to know what kind of help you need to go get and how soon. Um, the other thing is, it's not just their issue. It's a family issue. It is, involves the parents or the aunts, the uncles, the grand, who's ever taking care of that child and to let them know that you're in it together, that they're not gonna go through this alone would be very helpful. So. I also think it's really important to not wait until the child has come to you and said, I'm in crisis. You as the adults, need to be the ones to bring up the topic if you're seeing changes in your child and not be afraid to ask the question, have you been thinking about dying? Do you wish you weren't here anymore? Do you think our family would be better off without you? What's going on inside of you? If you can start the conversation before they tell you I'm actively suicidal, you can probably build in prevention before it's a true suicidal crisis. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to actually skip my third question to get on to all of your questions to make sure they get answered. So this next question was aimed first for Jim Clark but then there's a secondary that's very similar, so if anybody has anything to add. What does FAST, F-A-S-S-T, stand for? How do you work with kids? And are you eligible in other school districts? And then also, mental health first aid training. Jim? I've been with Frontier Behavioral Health for three years now. And I struggled with the acronym for the first two years. Um, I think I finally got it, so I, I'm not um, intimidated by your question. Um, FAST stands for Families and Schools Succeeding Together. So it's F-A-S-S-T. Um, the way the program works in the schools, uh, I think that what I said earlier probably is as accurate of a representation of it as I can, as I can give. The, the clinicians that are embedded in the schools work hand in hand with the school um, staff and administrators. Um, children are referred to them. Um, if they're uh, brought um, in school, the, the children are referred to them by school uh, teachers, by administrators, by folks who work in the school district who've identified an issue or a child has approached them saying that they would like to be seen by somebody. Um, the way that they're brought in to um, uh, services with a clinician is in a way that's not intrusive in the classroom so that the child won't feel singled out. Um, there isn't somebody who walks in and say, you know, it says, Joe, you need to come down and see your counselor right now. Uh, so the counseling appointments are set up 
so that it, that it eliminates or at least it tries to minimize that possibility so that the children don't feel as though they're having a, sh a spotlight shut on them. And um, families are brought into the services with the clinicians uh, depending on how the, how the case is um, presented by the child. Um, one of the more difficult things for the, for the clinicians, I would imagine that Dave's clinicians feel the same thing, that one of the most difficult things to do is to get the adults, to get the family members to come into the schools to work with the kids and the, and the clinicians. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that they have, and yet it's probably one of the most central pieces to a successful outcome in working with kids. Um, well, I don't know, they've, uh, we've been with them for close to 10 years now and uh, the, the relationship seems to be getting stronger and as I said earlier, I think one of the strongest elements of it is the fact that our funding allows us to be able to work with any child regardless of their financial situation. So that really opens it up uh, to us. Uh, moving on to the secondary question, which is the mental health first aid. We actually have somebody in the audience who works for Frontier Behavioral Health who um, is looking at me right now and probably a little bit nervous, who is one of our trainers. Um, I don't know whether or not there's, uh, whether Stacy or Mariah or somebody could speak to it. Otherwise, I would almost invite her to be able to come up and take the microphone and explain a little bit about it herself, unless there's somebody here on the panel who could do that. can do it justice to be honest with you Aileen um, but I do know that um, it's it's my understanding is that it's a training that um, we provide to the community to um, help people understand more about mental illness and how to deal with mental health in crisis but I'm probably not explaining it correctly because it's been very very little that you and I've talked with it, about it well I don't see Eileen jumping out of her seat to come no. up here to speak with us but <laughs> But I, uh, my limited understanding of mental health first aid is, is that uh, an, an analogy that has always worked for me is that it's CPR for mental health. Um, that it helps uh, individuals who are not professionally trained uh, do a better job of being able to understand what it is that they're seeing and how to respond appropriately to um, a mental health crisis when it comes up. And so it's a training that's offered to individuals out in the community. It's a training that's offered to all of our clinical staff. Um, and right now I'm probably gonna feel guilty enough that I'm gonna to have to go through that myself because it is a really good program. Seven? Yeah, um, so Odyssey Youth Movement, uh, myself in particular, I've been through um, mental health first aid as well as assist training. Um, both are really fantastic. Um, both touch on issues around suicide. Um, assist training is a full day long training um, that um, deals directly with um, suicide crisis and is really fantastic because probably the scariest part about assist training but the absolute best part is actually practicing interacting with somebody who's in that crisis mode doing that role play um, was actually part of both but uh, assist is specifically dealing with suicide crisis whereas mental health first aid um, so there's an adult and a young person uh, mental health first aid I took the personally set, um, went through and enjoyed the mental health youth uh, training. And it was really lovely because it looked at what does it look like um, when we have young people who are dealing with depression? What does it look like when we have young people who are dealing with anxiety? You know, what do these, what do these things specifically look like? And then what does it look like when we have young people in that, in the scope of that training that are dealing with or thinking about suicide. Um, whereas again, ASSIST um, was specifically suicide prevention, suicide crisis. Um, it was a topic that terrified me in the center. Uh, I've been there for four and a half years. I just took ASSIST training January this year. And um, finally, I mean, I wouldn't say I feel comfortable. I don't know that I will ever feel comfortable, but I feel comfortable enough to speak with young people and say, is this what you're thinking about? Is this what's going on? Um, and, and addressing them head on, um, both trainings really gave me a lot of confidence. So from a, a participant standpoint, um, that's what I experienced in those trainings. I just wanted to add, we're actually having um, mental health first aid at Passages next week. So um, we have openings. So if whoever asked that question wanted to call and get into that class for next week, that would be available to them. Great, thank you very much, Misty. Um, I'd like 
We actually have someone from ESD 101 that has done youth mental health first aid. And Ms. Jill Royston, I'm completely putting you on the spot. And we have a roving, roving microphone right there. If there's anything that any of the panelists missed, I would love for you to share. You bet. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, one thing that I would add is that what I appreciate most about youth mental health first aid is it not only identifies what are typical adolescent behaviors, and then what are the behaviors that you might notice when someone is starting to present in a mental health crisis or a mental health, um, you know, kind of emergent situation. Um, it also does a lot of practice, which I think is fantastic. It also shares a story of a young man that not only attempted but survived his attempt, so that offers that hope. And definitely it is meant for anybody. It is very much, as Jim mentioned, it's CPR for all of us. And ideally, it's catch, catching them before they get to crisis mode. So how do we have those conversations way earlier when they're starting to not sleep well, they're starting not to eat well? Um, and the ESD is also hosting um, an, a training in August uh, at West Valley School District that is free. So there's information outside on the table. If you're interested, we'd love to have you join us. Thank you, Chris. Great, thank you very much. I will move on to the next question. Can you touch on dangers or benefits of the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why and its extreme popularity? I have not seen it myself. I was just having this conversation prior to starting tonight's workshop. Is anybody familiar with? I have watched the show. Um, wanted to watch the show before we came here just so that I had something to speak to in, in regards to that being part of the topic. Um, it was an interesting show um, to watch the whole process play out and um, really just watch to some degree what seemed like missed, opp missed opportunities for this teenager to really have somebody step in and intervene in an appropriate time. Um, one of my biggest concerns that I feel happens not just in this scenario but in any other scenario where we have a teenager who commits suicide is that it felt it almost romanticized the idea of it, um, that it gave this sense of um, that the other people that had, in, had been involved were now going to feel horrible about what they had done and that it had changed their life and, and that they talked so much about how wonderful this teenager was and how much they missed her and how one, and I think it painted an unrealistic portrayal of what suicide does to a family, to a community, um, and might provide a false sense of understanding of what really happens after a teenager commits suicide. So that was part of my concern with the program. They probably can speak a lot more to that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, this, and I'm going to also share a little bit from a a family that a uh, building principal and I met with uh, who lost a child uh, to suicide. I'm um, going to say a few things about that. And one of the quotes that the family mentioned was, there's a lot of difference between reading about something and then seeing it. And if you look at the neurological development in your prefrontal cortex, it really doesn't develop fully into rational thought, knowing right from wrong and understanding reality versus non until you're about 23 to 25 years old. So don't let your children watch it alone. What we're finding is a lot of kids will get together or they'll watch it alone. Um, the family called it a stupid show because of the, the danger of the kids watching alone without an adult trying to help them understand. Um, and just want to go on kind of a statement for myself is there is a real difference in to children and adolescents that killing themselves and being dead are often two very different things. I have heard children say, I want to kill myself but they're not saying they want to be dead. Now, to you as adults and me, if I say I want to kill myself, I understand that translates into death. But to a child, that doesn't always mean the same thing. It means that they want the problem to stop, not that they don't want 
Another part of that problem is that, that show is they also brought her back walking through the school. Um, you can make an analogy to playing a video game. How many lives do you have? We understand death is permanent. Shows like that bring it back and say, oh, there is a reality after death that you come back to the school. I'm not saying there's not life after death. That's a personal belief system that people have. But suicide is a very permanent and terminal act. So just want you to understand that the thinking of that on the young brains, uh, 13 Reasons also recently has added uh, crisis hotlines at the end of the series. That's nice, but it's a little bit late. It uh, glamorizes it to some has been a concern. Another concern by professionals that are in, in the field are 13 uh, Reasons Why has been um, renewed for a second season. We don't know what that means, but uh, in the content that it will have, but is there a danger of the thoughts, visualizing, seeing that? Um, well, I can tell you very clearly, according to one family who lost their child, yes. According to the professionals, when you don't have the ability to differentiate between reality permanence in a way, yeah, you have really good parents out here and up here that will sit down and watch with their child. Most of the children and adolescents that I've talked to, they have not sat down with their parents and do that. So that's, that's a real concern with that. And I don't want to jump off that, but I'm going to say just a couple other issues. We started off talking about depression. Depression is the, second, is the first most common co-occurring with suicide. And childhood depression often gets misdiagnosed. And I want you to understand that. With younger children, it often gets misdiagnosed as ADHD or and because the behaviors get anxiety, they get impulsive, they get that way, or they swing the other way and they get very quiet and they get withdrawn. It's not just the acting out. Now, there's not always depression with suicide. Some of the children will do an act very impetuously. Um, and when you see something, it gives you a, a thought. And that's why the, one of the dangers that this family wanted me to share is it's like seeing it is different than just reading about it. Seeing it by themselves causes concern and issues. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about is that we talk about risk factors a lot with suicide and uh, childhood depression. We often don't talk about protective factors, and that was briefly mentioned. One of the best protective factors is a caring adult. A relationship that you talk about and you often don't do it in your definition of the words used and that's a mistake I see a lot of us do I mean myself included they might say a word and I go to my definition of what I think suicide is versus be quiet listen carry on a conversation with what they understand what are they asking make it a safe conversation because one of the things I know about children and adolescents is they will only share with you as much as they think you can handle. You watch them. They will kind of go and say, what can you handle? If this means a lot to me and you're not able to quite handle it, they'll back off. We want to make that as safe and as protective, and that's one of the best things we can do. Thanks. Um, one thing I wanted to add was... Um, the addition of substances um, that go along often, substance use. Um, you know, we now live in a state where marijuana is legal, uh, a certain amount, over the age of 21. But unfortunately, our young people see that as an option um, often. And obviously, we work a lot with uh, youth that are struggling with substance use. And if they also have an issue with um, anxiety, depression, um, their substance use is not going to make it any better. In fact, most likely it's going to make it a lot worse. And so one thing that I would really encourage parents to do is really, you know, get your children into drug treatment, have them assessed, and be supportive of them stopping their use. 
Um, you know, we do work obviously in reducing harm when it comes to substance use, but the goal is to not be using substances. As um, Dave had mentioned, you know, their brains are still continuing to develop. And if you add any kind of substance on top of that, whether it's nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, or any other, the other substances out there, um, you know, their impulsivity will go through the roof as well. They might make a really bad choice that they might not have made if they weren't under the influence. So along with the mental health issues, I would really encourage you, don't minimize their substance use. And, you know, uh, we sometimes work with families that may be struggling with their own substance use themselves as adults. Um, and that can be kind of a, a way to not address their children's use. And sometimes they only bring them in for treatment if they happen to be caught at school and get into trouble. So I would really encourage you to think about, you know, what, what's going on in your household? Do you need support um, for your own substance use? And then, of course, for your child. And, you know, talking about the issue of suicide, um, you know, unfortunately, in my career, I've been doing this over 20 years, you know, I've certainly lost, unfortunately, patients that have um, accidentally overdosed, <laughs> but unfortunately have um, had a completed suicide. So please, you know, don't minimize, especially marijuana use, do not minimize the use of marijuana. Thank you. And the access is extremely high for our youth. This next question is for Spokane Public School staff. What is the reentry process for a student going back to school after a suicide attempt? That's a wonderful question. And first and foremost, I'd like to say we need to know when a, is this for a student that has attempted? Correct. First of all, it's very, very important for the school to know this. Far too often, I, I believe that students attempt, and I feel that families uh, feel there's a, there's a taboo in talking about it, and they want to hide it, and we are not communicated. The school absolutely needs to be involved, and we need to know. We do um, abide by FERPA. And it is on a need-to-know basis only. It is confidential. But those are our highest need students, our most vulnerable, and we need to know. We have highly trained counselors and administrative staff and teachers that can provide extra support for students. We will sometimes provide special support plans for students. I have a couple students in our elementary schools, for example, that have, they get a, um, a warm handoff anytime they are going during transition from their home base to an elective class. We have support plans for our students in middle school and high school. We will have maybe a check-in and check-out with our counselors where the child will come in, check-in in the morning, check-in before they leave. We will have ongoing conversations with parents. We will share with the teachers what the family deems appropriate to share only. Um, we develop a strong partnership and we want to be here to support our students and provide the highest levels of support that we can. And how we do that is by partnership with you as parents and guardians. So we, we need to know, please. To add on to that, I know sometimes uh, we have families that bring their child to the emergency room for a risk assessment because they feel they need to have that to get back into the school. Our psych triage counselors do assessments for, they're assessing for either inpatient or outpatient. They don't do risk assessments, um, so Sacred Heart doesn't provide that. The only uh, place that I'm aware of is, or I think a couple places, Frontier Behavioral Response, Crisis Response does that, if I'm correct. Is that right, Stacy? Okay, great. Some of this is language in what is a risk assessment versus a threat assessment versus a suicide assessment, inpatient, outpatient assessment. And what we provide at Frontier Behavioral Health is 24-7 crisis intervention. And what that includes is meeting with you and your loved one about their crisis, which may involve suicidal thoughts or planning, or maybe they've already had an attempt, or maybe they're having thoughts to harm other people, as we talked about earlier, or that they're in a situation where they're not making good choices and they're putting their health and safety at risk because of some sort of mental disorder like depression. 
And so we absolutely provide that service. And that is a free service um, to the community. Um, we often see um, youth in our agency at Lutheran Community Services who have come out of a hospital stay because of suicidal ideation or a suicide attempt. And um, our first task is to partner with the, the individual and their family to make certain that the life that they're returning to is going to be a safe place for them, including safety in the home, first and foremost, and um, constant um, parental adult involvement and supervision. Um, it, it's a it's a step-by-step -step process, but it's a really important one so that, that this young person can feel like it's safe to return back to school, to their friends, um, because they're, they're going to be, um, unfortunately, in many cases, the, the victims of taunting or bullying about the event itself. And that can trigger yet a whole nother series of, of crises for these young folks. So planning carefully what happens after they leave the hospital is really critical because the suicidal ideation hasn't stopped completely. It has remitted to a place where professional staff believe the person is safe to be back out in the community again, but that young person um, still has a lot of internal work to do to really heal from the use of suicidal ideation um, or planning as a coping mechanism, and that's what it is for these young kids. It's a way to cope when they don't have any other skills in place. And thank you for including a little bit of a segue in actually our next question, which is a combination of two, because we do hear about bullying and how it causes suicide or attempts of suicide. How prevalent does school bullying and social media play in teen suicide? Um, I've had the privilege um, to work with schools and um, youth on every loss we've had over the last 10, 12 years. Um, one of the challenges with Spokane Public Schools, and that's what I'm going to talk about, is that the lives that we have lost do not fit and follow the national, oh, here's the profile. Many people want to say, oh, it's because of bullying. We're not finding that as a common thread in any of the suicides that we've had within the school system. We're not seeing that that is one of the reasons why. Now, on a national basis, yes, that is one of the common, but not in Spokane Public Schools. That's one of the frustrating parts to say, please help us understand they don't have a lot of the risk factors. These children, some of them have intact families. They're involved in school highly. They uh, you know, had one recently that uh, had just recently graduated and was accepted to college. I mean, they're not fitting a profile of the national mor norms there. So I can tell you that that is not what we're facing. But on a national stay, uh, standard, that would be one of the commonalities, so. One of the parts of the question that I heard was about social media, and um, I will say that, you know, in the, in the era that we live in now, information and misinformation are more than readily available at everybody's fingertips. Um, you know, and Dave, you had mentioned a few minutes ago about sort of the development of the that prefrontal cortex, that's the thinking, logical, cause and effect part of the brain. It doesn't really finish developing until kind of the early 20s or ever for some, maybe. Um, but when we are looking at things on social media, I mean, we hear a lot about fake news. And there are a lot of misperceptions about things that get circulated around social media, whether it's about suicide or about other topics. And our young people are seeing this. We're all seeing this. Our young people are seeing 
this stuff and sometimes may not have the ability to sort of differentiate um, kind of the, the reality of the situation. So if somebody on social media somewhere, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever says, this person committed suicide because they were being bullied in school, that spreads around and it becomes it may not be the truth, but for some it becomes the truth. It becomes what they're seeing and what they believe to be true. <clears throat> Excuse me, and so I think that's, we've talked a lot about opening up the lines of communication with our kids, and I think that is one of the reasons why it becomes really, really important for us to have really open communication with our kids because they are getting information from all sorts of places. Some of it true, some of it accurate, some of it wildly inaccurate and potentially downright harmful. And so if we can have open communication, if we can have conversations and dialogues with our kids, we can try to help them ferret out what's real, what's accurate, what's inaccurate, um, and, and kind of navigate those waters. I would ask Seven, if you have any different, because of the LGBTQ community with bullying and or non-acceptance. Yeah, so, <clears throat> Um, when thinking about risk factors, um, being part of the LGBT community, uh, unfortunately, does raise our um, suicide risk, um, especially for our transgender young people. Um, the risk is something like 40% attempt rate. Um, so that's astronomical. That's really, really, really high. Um, I do want to point out that's not every single transgender person. Um, that's not every single lesbian, gay, bisexual person. Um, but if we look at a community and if we look at trends and if we um, consider these things. And uh, there's some really fantastic research that looks at why. Um, and because it could be easy to jump to the conclusion that, oh, you have this identity, so you have this problem. Like, that is synonymous. Um, and we absolutely find that that's not the case. Uh, it's not that because, especially for our young people, because they're gay or bi, lesbian, et cetera, they automatically have this risk factor. But um, because of bullying, um, because of um, family rejection especially is, is more the issue, um, but that family rejection tied to that sexual orientation or tied to that gender identity um, becomes that risk factor. So when we have um, a supportive community around us, when we have a place that we feel we belong, we significantly lower those risk factors. Um, and that's where community centers, um, places like Odyssey Youth Movement, places like MLK Junior Center, um, North Central Center, um, places like that where young people have a place to belong and feel like they fit and feel like they um, have connection and friends um, becomes a preventative and becomes really, really important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David? Sorry, just, I just wanted to say a couple things on this one. Uh, a lot of times people my age say, oh, social media, there's a lot to blame. There's a lot of good that comes with that also. And so I don't want to just say, wow, social media is a cause. But I want to give you a situation where a, an, an adolescent girl came to me and said, my life is so boring and I'm kind of a nobody. And went on, she went on to say, and I'm just going to use an example, so Debbie posts a really cool thing that she did, and then Jim posts a really cool thing, and then Chris, oh, she went here. And so this adolescent was comparing her life to these snaps of multiple peoples at their best moments, and she was saying, I'm not doing anything. I don't have much good. So the comparison is really challenging. And I want to give you a part of a story. We lost a student several years ago, and this helped Dave Crump change his perception on a word that we use. Um, Spokane is a small community, and media, so I mean social media, has made it even smaller. We lost a student, and we started getting phone calls from all the surrounding school districts, and I was talking to all kinds of students saying, I lost my friend. And I said, how did you know this person? Oh, I've never met him. That was the change in, in my learning. A definition of a friend 
at my generation is different than are you a friend or how many likes do you have? And that, I found that there was a great impact on even if you don't know them personally, if you are friends with them on social media, it has an impact. So I know that was an answer that kind of covered both ways, but it helped me broaden my definition of what a friend is. So thanks. Thank you for that. This next question is, I've recently heard of the new blue whale game. Self-injury for 50 days with increasing severity of injury until you commit suicide on the 50th day. What, if anything, have you all heard about this? I, this is the first time I've heard about this. I heard about uh, this uh, actually a few weeks ago. Uh, it was brought to attention by actually Frontier, one of their MHPs had shared it with us that it was out there. Um, it wasn't here in Spokane, but it was over on the East <coughs> Coast. Um, and they had a, uh, a, an adolescent who actually killed themselves uh, because of this so-called game that they're, that they're playing. And it originated, I think, over in Australia or something like that. And it has gotten across, and it is now here in the United States. Um, but I haven't heard it come this way, but it is very detailed. Um, it outlines day by day what you do and staying up, drinking, getting into trouble and cutting on yourself and it's very detailed and you have to do uh, what it says each day uh, until, until the end. Mm. So. Anybody have anything else to add, Stacy? I have not heard of this game. Um, and I don't know, this isn't really an answer to that question, but just kind of a comment about that and the social media and the romanticizing. And I, d I also have not seen that show, 13 Ways, um, 13 ways or whatever it's called yeah. either. Um, but what I can say is that we know that things like this game or things like this show or talking about it or celebrities dying in the media, I mean, those kinds of things that they don't necessarily plant that thought in people's brains but what we do believe is that it might give people more courage so if they've already been thinking about killing themselves hearing about it seeing about it having a game that pushes their comfort level it gives them more courage and that's sometimes why we see increased suicides after an event and so this game is just promoting that and it actually makes me sick um, what I would say and again I have not seen this TV show to know how well it portrays um, if there's any value out of it um, but if your kids are interested and they want to watch it they're gonna watch it um, I would just offer as a an addition another show another video something that promotes recovery someone who has lived experiences that have um, that are now in recovery that um, have gone through such a horrible um, part of their life but then now are thriving and just kind of balance that and and have that discussion and so I guess that's all I would add to that and to Stacy I'm piggybacking on you a lot this evening um, of course, it would be advantageous for you to encourage your child to watch something else. But if they really are adamant that they want to watch it, watch it with them. I actually, my, my freshman daughter and I watched the series together. And we paused it so many times and spoke about it. There were so many things, life lessons to talk about, situations to talk about. Honey, what do you think the intent was of, of that person's action? How do you think that made that person feel? T let's talk about the response and, and let's talk about it. And what do you think and why do you think? And we had a real in-depth conversations. Um, conversations that truly I don't know if I would have had those specific conversations had I not been watching this TV series with her. I would ask her, what is something that the, the girl could have done differently? If you're ever in that situation, what can you do? How could you handle yourself? 
Who could you reach out to? So the, the conversations, like I said, if, if they are adamant and they do want to watch it, please watch it with them. It would be, um, it would be uh, really sad if you didn't because there are so many things that you can talk about with your child. And as, as, these, as a couple of gentlemen up here have alluded to, that prefrontal cortex is not developed. And it's our job as parents to watch it with our kids and have those in-depth conversations. Pause it and talk about it. Um, I just a, a couple of things. One about the 13 reasons, and 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 I, I wanted to add a little bit on uh, social media, which is just sort of a personal observation um, related to the social media. I think that I'm, I'm looking down the panel, and I, I think that I'm pretty close to being accurate anyway. That I'm probably the senior member on this on this panel, so I've earned the right to have conversations where I say back in the day. Um, but 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 back in the day. Um, uh, it, it, social media was not something that was really an issue. It wasn't something that was available. Communication was about what I'm doing right here, having face-to-face -face conversation with an individual. Um, the connection between that dynamic versus social media, in my mind, social media to me is, is social media um, at its worst is a faceless communicator. And um, I know that I could make a provocative statement in front of everybody here um, and not have any idea how any one of you have perceived what it is that I just said. Because every person in this room has a life experience that, are, that has allowed them to create a set of filters um, through which everything is perceived. So everybody can come up with a wildly different explanation for what it is that I just said. At least when I'm sitting here looking at you, I can see the response. Social media doesn't allow you that opportunity to do that. Um, so it's sent out and a child who is wounded and who is contemplating suicide and is making a decision about taking this final step, um, you have no idea how what you just put out over the airwaves is impacting that individual and you have no idea whether there is somebody with that child um, who can process whatever the reaction is to it. Um, uh, largely because of that, I've made a personal decision that I don't have any connection with social media. Um, I would prefer having conversations like this with people, um, having that kind of interaction where I have an opportunity to read what reaction has just happened as a result of what I've said. Um, and it doesn't mean that I'm advocating for people to ask everybody in their family or yourselves to eliminate social media from your life. That's my personal decision. Um, but I, I do want to piggyback on what everybody else has said, which is to stay involved to pay attention to what happens on the phone that you're probably paying for if you're a parent, um, to not, not be shy about asking questions and to be intrusive if that's what it takes if you have a question. Uh, related to 13 Reasons, one of the things that upset me about it, there were a lot, um, was that the parents went right to the threshold of taking that step and really becoming intrusive in their child's lives. But as soon as they got right to that threshold, they stepped back and they didn't take that next step to find out what was needed um, that they had questions about. Um, I think that there was some value in the show, as disturbing as it was for me to watch it. Um, one of the values um, is that it was provocative enough that it's caused things like this to happen and has gotten people to raise their awareness and begin having conversations with their kids, with their families, with their loved ones. Um, that always can have value. And I think one of the other things that, um, I mean, it was very theatrically dramatic, um, but one of the other things that I thought came across pretty well was that there is no element that is too small um, for you to ignore. Uh, there are a myriad of things, little, that you might just overlook that might be having an impact on somebody. And the only way you're going to notice that is if you notice what's going on in your child's life, if you pay attention, if you look, if you ask questions, if you stay involved and you get involved. Thank you. And I would ask if, if any of the panelists or even any of the audience members has a, an idea of a program that comes to mind that does have that, that positive person that has gone through recovery, that maybe we can share it with each other as well before we leave tonight. We do have less than 10 minutes left from uh, ending, but I do want to ask this important question. Are there any culturally relevant programs or interventions for people or students of color 
who express a concern of ending their lives. As far as um, culturally relevant, um, we definitely have a lot of families that will choose to come to our facility because they are Native American and we do have a number of our staff that are here that um, often families will feel more comfortable being in an environment that they feel welcome and purely because that they see people that look like them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had a student say to, to us that they were being bullied at school and the, but they knew walking through our doors that they would see someone that looked like them. And even though we all are not all Native American that work there, but that's just one thing that is great to have an opportunity to be able to provide somewhere safe where um, families can come and feel accepted just by walking in the door and hopefully we create an environment that is very welcoming to them. I would like to add um, just a side note. I've actually been in their facility in their lobby and it might be the most welcoming place I have ever been. It's, ve it's set up very nicely and it's such a different experience than going to just like your regular doctor's office in that kind of sterile environment. So you guys really do a nice job. Um, I will say at Frontier Behavioral Health, we have a multicultural team, so we can provide um, counseling, um, consultation, um, actually to our system of care, so other mental health agencies within our system can contact us and get multicultural consultation. Um, we provide training to our crisis teams, and the um, additional components that we're looking at is um, really related to protective factors. So when we're looking at someone who is expressing suicidal thoughts and understanding their culture and what it, um, is of value and what kinds of things that we want to work with their family or their community to put in place, because we know that that is such a huge protective factor. Um, Seven had mentioned um, that connection as well, um, the family unit being so important, safety being so important. And so those are the things that we take into consideration when we are working with someone of color. Um, I don't know, Jim, if you want to add anything more to some of the services or Mariah. Did you? This is kind of an indirect way of addressing this, but um, one of the issues that, that we hear about at Lutheran frequently is um, youth and children with any kind of difference um, having feelings of being suicidal or actually being bullied at school and told because you're this, you probably should kill yourself. And we've actually had kids in services tell us that this is what's been going on. Um, kids who are um, on the autism spectrum especially um, are vulnerable to that kind of peer pressure and there's a very, very, very high percentage of individuals on the spectrum who um, admit to having been suicidal. So I think any differences really need to be paid attention to and, you know, our efforts need to be about inclusion rather than exclusion. Um, I, I mentioned them before and I, I'm happy to mention them again because they're just really fantastic. The MLK Junior Center, um, they're open for anybody, but of course, uh, you know, as the name implies, um, primary focus on African American community and they have um, case management staff. So. I'm not part of their staff, I, I'm not with them, so I, I can't say exactly like what, what their focus or what their training is, but in building that community and building um, connections in finding um, supportive services, uh, in finding people that look like you and, and have similar experiences to you, uh, I think that they're a really, really valuable resource. Um, their staff are amazing and I know that they have case management, so looking out for some resources. Um, while not racial, of course, Odyssey Youth Center, um, has that cultural component, and that's something that's really, really important to us that we foster is um, building that community, um, building that sense of self, and, and finding a place where you belong. And I know that uh, Dr. Redinger has had Spokane Public School staff go through the Intercultural Development Inventory, but I wanted to make that uh, known before I give it back to Dave. Just, uh, I, I love this conversation. Um, 
But I also want to say one of the things that we have trained our administrators on, our counselors on, uh, our mental health therapists, even the office staff, is culture is, includes race and ethnicity, but it is so much broader in many ways. And it's like, how do you deal with the culture because of the different languages? We may look the same, but very different in where we come from that they've kind of really done some really beautiful training on what is and how do you listen and how do you intervene in a very sensitive but individualized way, just because I may look one way. Spokane Public Schools has also done a really good job of trying to understand why is there a disparity. We don't have all the answers, but it's on and what we're trying to address. So it's like, that, you know, I kind of just want to say that because it's like, wait a second, the culture you and I came from, we may say, oh, we have this commonality, but it may be very different. Not to minimize any other, but it's like, so I just want to share that. Thank you. And with that, we are out of time. We do have a couple, actually a few questions here that remain unanswered. So I would ask you if you had an, an unanswered question, if you wanted to stay behind, we would ask our panelists, our experts up here to Stay just a few more minutes for a one-on-one -on -one if, if you have time. I again want to thank you for being here. This is not a one-time discussion. Spokane Public Schools recognized the need to begin this discussion. And so this is going to be part of an ongoing topic of conversation that's hard, but it's needed. So I just wanted to share that with you. And again, thank you for being here, taking the time out of your schedule. And thank you, panelists. And if you would please remember to fill out your purple survey and drop it in the basket on your way out. Thank you. <laughs>